Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another part of Interstellar Quest. We're going to be tying up all the loose ends. You might have seen a live stream which I did where I covered landing on Tylo. Well, this is, of course, the Draco which had been stuck in orbit after its long mission. It had been infected by the Nan Plague. Not a number does not compute. Breaks things. In fact, it had infected its, all its fuel systems. And using the good old-fashioned Pardo push, we had uh, put it onto a, an orbit, an eccentric orbit, which would graze through the atmosphere, and therefore I was hoping that I would be able to land it. So this is me trying to bring it down. Now you see that the periapse, the initial periapse, is roughly over the equator. I, I want to bring this down. Uh, obviously, I want to keep it between about 30 and 40 kilometers, right? And well, this is why I'm nose flipping the thing upside down, angling it downwards so that the bottom of the aircraft pushes it down and stops the natural tendency of its orbital velocity to lift it back up higher into the atmosphere. So I'm just tuning this and watching my vertical speed as I'm bleeding off energy here. Now, I'm obviously also going to have to look for a place to safely land this thing. And if I judge this just right, I should be able to get over the poles. We are in a highly eccentric orbit but uh, you can see that I'm gonna miss the polar ice cap for uh, by a bit so I take a little roll over to the the right and start trying to adjust my trajectory to keep it to bring it down in the correct direction you can see it's starting to turn very slowly bringing it over the large white area at the South Pole which is thankfully largely flat oh albeit there are a few mountains and st hazards to avoid but uh, I do a pretty good job of getting myself lined up. So uh, that's where we're aiming for. The trick is now to make sure that we have bled off enough energy and can control it and turn myself around and com uh, commit to a graceful landing on the ice. Now, believe it or not, in real life, you can actually get flat, uh, large areas of ice, which are okay for aircraft to land on uh, in, an in Antarctica. And they use these. They're called blue ice airfields, I believe. Now, what happens is the mountains in Antarctica, they can adjust the airflow. And in particular, there are areas in Antarctica which are so dry because the mountains have basically captured all the snow. And by the time the wind gets over them, there's no uh, moisture in it. Now, uh, add to that enough winds, you know, prevailing winds to keep the areas clean. And you can get large, flat areas that are kind of eroded continuously until they're, they're flat or at least flat enough that they can operate wheeled aircraft from them. Uh, near the coast of Antarctica, there's also the the uh, ice airfield near McMurdo Base, I believe, and that comes up every year when there's enough sea ice. You know, they clear out an area and use that as a runway, and they'll land aircraft on it too to supply the base. Anyway, we're starting to reach the edge of the ice cap, and so it's time to perform a U-turn. I just passed over the pole, so I'm going to try and aim to get as close to the pole as possible. Now, on a more uh, temporary basis, the McMurdo base I read about, they also have a, an ice airfield that they operate during the Antarctic winter. Uh, they have to have sea, it's on the sea, it's basically sea ice, which is sufficiently cleared and flat enough that they can use it to land uh, wheeled aircraft on. But the interesting thing I guess I read is that when they land the aircraft, you know, and they have to park them while they're doing unloading them, they have sensors set up that show if the aircraft is adjusting and sinking because the wheels will slowly sink into the ice. And if they sink more than about 10 inches, then it gets to the point where they might actually have trouble getting out of the holes that they've cut for themselves. So they have the sensor set up and if they move too far, then they move them to another spot and they'll keep on doing it while the aircraft is there. Anyway, I have performed my big movement. I've turned through 180 degrees. I'm still over the mountains. You can see the ridges here. And because we are near to the pole, those ridges are actually quite exaggerated. They're very steep. They're very small. Uh, this might, very small features change very, very rapidly. This is a standard feature of poles in Kerbal Space Program because of the way the PQS system uses a uh, cylindrical terrain map wrapped onto a spherical surface, meaning the poles are all warped. It does, however, appear that I have sufficient altitude and speed to get over the over the edge of these mountains and over to the flat area ahead. Obviously, if I didn't, I would be doomed because I don't even have any RCS thrusters on this. It has no uh, no engines of its own. It's now completely dead, 
flying through the sky with a super high-tech fusion reactor which no longer works. Okay, 140 meters per second, and now we're starting to now we're starting to begin to flare out a little. So raising the or raising my nose so that my descent speed drops below about five meters per second, and bingo, touchdown! And we only lost one tiny little piece of the aircraft. Of course, we will now need to uh, sanitize it to remove all hint of NEN infection. Anyway, the next thing I had going was, of course, the Tylo-bound uh, interplanetary lab. Obviously, I originally wanted to go everywhere else, but I decided to take it just to Tylo because everybody really just wants to see everyone saying, get on with it! So yeah, this was a live stream which I figured I would do because it was just around the 100th uh, episode or thereabouts, give or take a few. Um, Obviously, this is running at four times regular speed, and you can see me intensely concentrating in the bottom right-hand corner. Of course, if you want to see the actual live stream and hear all the comments to the people that were there, then uh, you can do that. But yes, we landed on the surface of Tylo, and we collected all the sciences. And then I went off, had a bit of a rest, uh, Valentine's Day, and uh, got sick. And got sick, and got sick, got better, and decided I'd better continue this whole series. So yes, I return to the game, and it's time to get the team back together. City Kerman throttles up the fusion engine, and starts launching towards orbit of Tylo. Now, of course, he wants to try and at least make a decent attempt at matching the inclination of the target object, so he's using the the nav ball markers. We've targeted the the, the object in orbit to make sure that we end up in the same plane as it, Except that I foolishly got everything back to front and of course need to turn all the way over and start firing in the opposite direction. It's good this spacecraft has copious amounts of Delta V, enabling it to uh, make such mistakes with impunity and uh, nothing more than a little bit of embarrassment. Certainly no mission dooming consequences as a result of this. Oh, nice view on the way up there. I like I like flying away from lot from sites and the planets and being able to look down and see it below me. There's somewhat something uh I, I think it lends the game uh, a great deal of scale, let's say. Even though it's one tenth of regular scale, it's still pretty cool to be able to do that. Okay, and we're almost up to orbital velocity. Now it's just a case of matching orbits. And in this case, I decided it was just easiest to, um, to match orbits out at Apple Apps and then uh, very aggressively pretty much uh, head straight towards the target. Now, of course, that a huge amount of delta V only applies to the fusion engine. It does not apply to the reaction control system, which I need to use for final rendezvous. We cannot use the fusion drive when we are within two and a half kilometers off the target. Otherwise, we will irradiate everyone involved and give them a couple of extra heads, which might offset our mass calculations a little. Then again, if you've got two heads, then you probably want to be using the improbability drive instead. And I believe the consequences of using an unshielded improbability drive are a little stranger than growing extra heads, limbs, and uh, tumors. Anyway, regardless, the plan is to get to just outside the magic 2.5 death barrier limit, and then drop my velocity down to about 10 meters per second. And from there, I will pr move in very, 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 very carefully and tediously and slowly, using a time acceleration to at least make the whole thing a little more careful, a little more uh, bearable, sorry. And uh, then I'll hopefully be able to dock the whole thing. As I approached the lab, it turned out that uh, I had to fly down the length of the spacecraft, which let me leisurely view this, uh, well, this beauty pass, let's say, of the spacecraft. Of course, this is running at four times regular speed, which uh, accounts for the nice smooth frame rate, because without that, it would be horrifically slow. Look at it there, the very definition of majesty. All the power in the rear, all the science in the front, and some squishy stuff up there as well. Yeah, this is the pinnacle of exploration technology. Assuming we forget about that whole Yogur uh, warp drive capable spacecraft. Turns out after its first test uh, trip, they decided to take the, the Yogur back to the lab to upgrade it, make it a little more capable. Its range wasn't quite what people expected. Its landing characteristics weren't uh, 
satisfactory, and ultimately it wasn't really interstellar capable. We still have to unlock that feature as far as I'm concerned. And uh, yeah, we bring this back safely and now we have to head off towards another target. So yeah, uh, we light up the main drive system and for about five minutes I was firing the engines and wondering why it was flexing so much and why I didn't seem to be going anywhere. I was worried we were going to have another NAN incident. Let's switch back to old me to find out what he, what was discovered. Hmm, okay, so I'm seeing 297 kilonewtons. I'm generating that specific impulse is solid. It's not flamed out or anything. We've got fuel, we've got tritium. That is very straight. Oh, yes, that would explain a lot of things. Yes, uh, when you've got multiple engines, try to make sure they're at least firing in the same direction. Oh, how I laughed when I discovered that. Of course, you don't want to hear me laugh because I've got it all time accelerated and it would just sound like the maniacal goblin or something like that. Anyway, yeah, uh, firing up the engines, of course, finally getting moving. We, uh, we increase our velocity till we are able to escape from the sphere of influence of Tylo. Now, we had another spacecraft coming in that was going to arrive and uh, land at Paul. However, this thing happens to be on the scene. It happens to have plenty of fuel. And to be honest, it's going to take me less time to get it there than it is to get one of those old low-tech spacecraft using ye old fashioned fission drives. So the decision is made. Let's head for Paul. Let's find out what we can find out. Let's get the science, plant that flag. And then it will be only Elu left to complete my uh, catalog. So we follow the same approach as before, going into a, a capture orbit and then going into a, an eccentric orbit for the actual landing, trying to uh, minimize the amount of time that I spend faffing around in this very slow and unwieldy spacecraft, and instead concentrate on the far lighter, far more maneuverable uh, lander type spacecraft, which I I don't know if we ever came up with a name for this thing. Oh well, it's too late now, but please, come up with some suggestions. Technically, we don't even need the spacecraft to land on, on uh, Paul, because Paul's escape velocity is lower than that of Minmus. Uh, on the other hand, we would like to bring all the scientific gear down just for bragging rights. We want to, of course, collect science from everywhere in the solar system so that we can, I don't know, maximize the amount of times we can buffer warp drive or whatever. I mean, that is a key feature of the uh, Interstellar mod is that you can upgrade some of the items by spending science. And that's a one-time spend. You spend the science on it and it gets upgraded and that version then becomes the better one. But if you ever recover it or destroy it, then you've lost that science forever. In particular, one of the things you can upgrade is the warp drive to advanced field geometry, which makes it more better. I'm not exactly sure what it does, but I'll have that. You can upgrade the... Um, computer core to make it a, an AI, of course, which I have done that lets it collect more science. And anyway, yeah, we are coming in towards landing very, very rapidly. So I, I basically dropped down till I was about, you know, just above one kilometer and then fired the engines to very quickly kill my speed. Now I'm just going to drop down slowly onto the surface here. Now this is Paul. It has a very crinkled, crackled surface and it has these big spiky rock-shaped structures sticking up. Of course, those are all uh, just cosmetic. If you uh, fly into them, nothing happens. Well, nothing happens beyond passing through them. You're not going to find your spacecraft destroyed unless you panic. Anyway, science time. You wonder if you can bring back some Paul for your garden on Kerbin. Because uh, I see lots of gardens around Kerbin, right? Okay, and we want... The mystery goo says... The goo starts buzzing like a bumblebee. Bzzz. Yes, it's a bee, not a wasp. We don't like wasps. But bees, bees are nice. Observe the materials bay. Some of the samples have shriveled up. Okay, now on to seismic data. 
After squinting at the device, you can still see vibrations from your landing on the moon, circling the very tiny globe. Obviously, atmosphere scan doesn't work. Landing on the planet is allowed for highly detailed scans of the interior. Who cares? The temperature varies from one rock formation to another. They must conduct heat differently. Yes, they must. Anyway, time for a quick jaunt around the surface. And Sidzi makes a pivotal discovery. He has discovered the material, the unobtainium, that is required for antimatter. Yes, that uh, warp drive they've been building hasn't quite performed as they have expected. But I'm sure with the understanding of antigravity, they will unlock truly interstellar capabilities on their uh, spacecraft. We found the secret of anti-gravity! Now we can build a real interstellar capable warp drive. Yes, because obviously that's what I was waiting for, right? We needed to we needed to finish off some of the other exploration before we could really head off to other star systems. Had to finish off all my other missions. Looking at the jagged rocks, you feel very thankful about not landing on them, even though they just look jagged. As you pick up the samples, your eyes start to water. Thinking it would be good, not good to sneeze in your suit, you put them back down very quickly. I would not be surprised if there are people that would suffer from moon dust allergies. So with the information that will unlock the true power of the warp drive finally in our hands, the time has come to put a call out to Kerbal astronauts everywhere. We have the one important mission that we have been waiting for. Up in high orbit we have a pair of Kerbals manning the reactor control room, it's time for them to come home and be part of this mission, a mission which is more important than anything that has ever been done by Kerbal Society. More ambitious, more groundbreaking, or space breaking as the case may be. Space warping, really. Yes, Heramon and Arik Kerman are gonna head back. They didn't have much to play, uh, much of a role in this series, but they are going to be part of the grand exodus beyond the, beyond the place that we call home. This is our most ambitious mission yet. We need all hands on deck. We all need everyone to come with us. Everyone at least that is qualified. Back when these guys started their career, they were using good old-fashioned chemical rockets, and indeed, Chemical rockets is what they're using to get home. None of these fancy space planes with, you know, nuclear-based engines. No, these are these are burning straight up chemicals. Chemical reactions exploding through a nozzle into the vacuum to supply thrust. Isn't that way more raw and primal than perhaps physically manipulating the curvature of space-time like that seatbelt appears to be doing there next to him? That is a minor bug that needs fixed, by the way, devs. When you have one or two Kerbals in uh, the three-man pod, they should call the window seats rather than the, the terrible seat in the middle with absolutely no visibility. I mean, sure, Jebediah was always in the middle, but uh, it doesn't make so much sense anymore now that he is truly confirmed to be badass rather than simply oblivious to the dangers around him. So who else have we in low carbon orbit? Yeah, well, we have Dancy Kerman, who's been studying this giant rock for the last few months. Well, his ride is here too, and he's, of course, taking it. Uh, he's the only one here, in fact, because uh, his associate, the person that was assigned to work with him, the Kerbal, um, it, he had to go off chasing after this uh, rogue space capsule in the, the claw, the grabber. And he is currently docked at the low carbon orbit Skylab 1 thing. Space Lab 1. Well, it looks like uh, Dancy Kerman actually did a better job at landing close to the uh, space center compared to his friends. Finally, in low carbon orbit, we have Dildred, Lars, and Frank Kerman. Yeah, we also have a uh, Lanber Kerman. Unfortunately, we have only room for three, so he doesn't get to go on the voyage. There's also that other problem of him being possessed by some sort of alien mind tech controlling technology thing that made him do crazy things. So we don't trust him and we're not going to take him in our super high tech warp ship. But that will be in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.